Hello, I'm Daniel Gordon. I'm Senior Lecturer in European History, and I'd like to welcome you all to this online undergraduate conference on 1989 to 91, the birth of contemporary Europe. Okay, so um, I'd like to start by getting us in the spirit of the time with some music. Right Here, Right Now by Jesus Jones, recorded in May 1990, was inspired by being one of the first Western bands to play in Romania after the violent overthrow of the communist dictatorship of Nicolae Ceausescu the previous December. If, like me in 1990, you were 15 and vaguely trying to be cool, there was a fair chance you were listening to this. The song is an example of a Western-centred gaze towards Eastern Europe, which we'll be examining critically in the course of this conference. Jesus Jones may have enjoyed visiting Romania as part of the British Council-sponsored tour British Rock for Romania in February 1990, uh, but I suspect they wouldn't have wanted to actually be right here, right now, on top of that tank uh, as Bucharest burned a few weeks earlier. Indeed, the music video actually features the band singer watching the Cold War end on his TV from the comfort of his sofa in London. Nevertheless, it does capture a certain excitement felt by many at the time about, as the song puts it, watching the world wake up from history, conveying why 30 years on, this is a moment worthy of our attention. The aim of this conference is twofold. First and foremost, to examine in depth a major turning point in contemporary European history. I picked 1989 to 1991 because having taught the history of communism for a long time, I've become convinced that one of the biggest challenges in doing so is conveying to students born afterwards a sense that the collapse of communism was not, as might superficially appear in retrospect, inevitable. And because many of us, your, your, your lecturers, are old enough to remember this period, while most of you uh, obviously aren't, there's a nice opportunity here to mix historical analysis with the sharing of personal memories. 30 years is a generation. The two longest serving historians at Edgehill actually started working here in 1989 and 1990 respectively, which uh, for the current generation of students um, are probably about as distant to you as um, the 60s are to me. Periods recent enough to be reference points, yet sufficiently different in their assumptions, that you should never take anything for granted about understanding them. There's also something of an emergent memory culture about this period in popular culture right now, as, as um, I think you can see in current TV hits from It's a Sin, to Deutschland 89. So I think there's a real moment to be seized here. This is relevant to a range of modules, both ones you may already be taking or have taken and those which you, 
or indeed your successors watching this in future years, may take. There will obviously be some 20th century history for, for, the, for the first years, some communism, some French history, and some European politics uh, for the second years, but also uh, some historiography for the third years, some threads left over from 1968 for those of you who may take the 1968 special subject in future, and some migration history for those of you who may take the migration and mobility module in future. Which brings me to the second aim of the conference, representing an exciting innovation uh, in um, our teaching programme here at Edge Hill. Some years back, Alison Brown organised undergraduate conferences on the history of crime. But we've never brought together several different modules together at once, focusing on a single historical moment. And if the conference format focusing on a single historical format is, is a success, we may do this again in future years, um, hopefully in real life. So, so um, I'd, I'd be very interested to have your, your feedback on how, how this goes. Essentially, the idea is to emulate an academic conference as a way of developing your skills. Going to conferences is one of my personal favourite activities as an academic because you get access to lots of contrasting expert perspectives hammering out a single theme in a way that can really add up to more than the sum of its parts. And I want to give you a taste of that. I'm also conscious that many students find giving presentations and public speaking in general a daunting exercise. So the conference will give you more practice of that in an encouraging and supportive environment that will, I hope, boost your confidence for future. So I'm very grateful to those of you who volunteer to speak or chair a session or write the conference report. And I'd like the rest of you, especially those of you who don't feel particularly comfortable speaking in public, to learn from their example. Uh, and indeed uh, that, that of um, the lecturers and, and guest speakers uh, speaking at it, and perhaps think about following suit in future. Indeed, you can start on the day of the conference, Monday the 22nd of March, by contributing to discussions and questions, which there will be plenty of opportunity for. So, I'd like to begin our proceedings by opening up a theme for the conference. Was 1989 to 91 the birth of contemporary Europe? Well, probably the most influential observer in the English-speaking world of the collapse of communism in Eastern and Central Europe was the British journalist and historian Timothy Garton Ash, whose eyewitness accounts of events in Warsaw, Budapest, Berlin and Prague were brought together in a book variously published as The Magic Lantern and We the People. Looking back a decade later, in the introduction to another book, History of the Present, he wrote some very useful re reflections on how to approach the challenging task of writing about very recent events with the rigour of a historian. And one of the so sound pieces of advice Garth and Ash gives is take lots of notes. For as he thought to himself, as history was being made in Prague in November 1989, if I don't write this down, nobody will. So uh, on, on the 22nd of March, in a sense, you're all going to be Timothy Garton Ash for the day. I'm not going to record the uh, live part of the conference because I know that that can put people off speaking. And also because actively making notes from it will help develop your uh, understanding. Garton Ash was not the only Western historian to make their name as a result of the collapse of European communism. Another example is Tony Judd, previously an accomplished, if relatively low profile, historian of French socialism, who, as a result of meeting Czech and Polish dissident exiles in the UK and US in the early 80s, started to become fascinated with the struggle for democracy and pluralism in Central Europe. Then, as chance would have it, he was right in the middle of Europe, literally in a taxi in Vienna in December 1989, when he heard on the radio the news of Ceausescu's fall. As it 
by then was already starting to look like a consequence of 1989 would be the reunification of Europe, and its two divided halves coming together again. Chuck decided that what the world of historiography needed was a history of contemporary Europe that really brought together the stories of its apparently separated Eastern and Western halves. Eventually, this became his best-selling book, Post-War, which I can recommend as an introduction to considering Europe both before um, and indeed after 89. As Jack put it in Thinking the 20th Century, a poignant autobiographical interview he did 20 years later while dying from motor neurone disease, I was hoping to encourage readers to think of Eastern Europe not as some alien communist suburb of Russia, but rather as part of a single European story, albeit one with very different and complicated subplots. So I've designed this conference, uh, challenging the, the uh, spirit of Tony Judd. We'll be exploring not just what did 89 mean for Eastern Europe, but also for Western Europe and how the two interacted. So hence why the, the morning is, is um, on Eastern and Central Europe and the afternoon is on, is on Western Europe. But we'll see there are lots of interconnections between the two. Because one happy consequence of the way the European migration is made possible by 89 is that we have amongst our speakers and also our uh, pre-recorded oral testimony, a diverse range of, of speakers from different countries across Europe, thus mitigating the dangers of for want of a better word, West-splaining or Brit-splaining. Now, having said that, having allocated myself the, the uh, fun task of the, the bird's eye introductory overview, I'm conscious of not, not being a research specialist on most of the countries that I'm going to be mentioning. So feel free to shoot me down at the conference, um, especially, especially those of you with specific expertise or personal experience. So you know, th this is... In, this is uh, intended to be um, the start of a dialogue as much as it is um, a lecture. Now, some of Tony Jutt's subplots, um, like uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the 9th of November 1989, may be, uh, may be um, already, already very familiar to you. So um, I'm going to start with some uh, rather less well-known ones. Now, um, this conference was originally planned as an in-person event for the 16th of March 2020 and uh, postponed for the, for the same reason that everything else um, that, that spring was. But you may be wondering why a 1989 anniversary conference was originally planned for 2020 rather than uh, 2019. Well, um, if we leave aside the accidents of when particular modules happen to, to run in which semester, the more, the more academic answer is that history's turning points are rarely as clearly defined as we might imagine. A bit like the idea that quite a lot of, we, of, we, of what we think of as the 60s or 1968 really happened in the early 1970s. Well, it's also true that a lot of what is often designated by the shorthand 1989 only got going in earnest towards the back end of 89 and was still happening throughout 1990. So here, for example, is the East German secret police headquarters in Berlin being ransacked in January 1990. Indeed, there is sometimes a tendency among students to elide 1989, um, that is to say the, the collapse of communism in the satellite states of Central and Eastern Europe, with 1991, i.e. the collapse of the Soviet Union itself, as if they were exactly the same thing, which they weren't. They, those are distinct, if nevertheless causally related, sets of events. Because it's easy to forget that the, that the Soviet Union did not formally cease to exist until the 1st of January 1992, more than two years after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Moreover, the transformation that had first unfolded in Hungary, and uh, for reasons that second-year student Anja Wojcik uh, 
we'll, we'll be explaining at the conference, Poland, in the spring and summer of 89, had elements of evolving transition rather than necessarily overnight revolutionary change. Gart and Ash terms what happened in, in Hungary and Poland revolutions, part reform, part revolution, characterising those initial cases by an unexpected degree of willingness on the part of governments and oppositions to negotiate with one another. Even if by autumn 1989, the tendency was to, to rapidly speed up. As one piece of graffiti in Prague put it, Poland 10 years, Hungary 10 months, East Germany 10 weeks, Czechoslovakia 10 days. There were still some anomalies that disrupt any sense you may have that this was a, a straightforward or inevitable process. During, and to, to some extent even after, 89, the Soviet Union itself, as opposed to the satellites, still looked like a going concern. In 1989, informed observers of the Soviet Union were still looking forward to what one described as a protracted process of reform extending into the next century. In March 1990, the USSR, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, got a new institution in the shape of a presidency, indirectly elected by the Supreme Soviet. So General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev was duly elected President Gorbachev and got more powers. Internationally, well, clearly weakened by its impotence to do anything about the restoration of capitalism and its former satellites, the USSR was still signing important international treaties, like the 2 plus 4 agreement on the 12th of September 1990 that agreed the German unification. Now, it's true that the USSR was accepting German unification under duress, but then not all of the Western powers were uh, exactly enthusiastic about it either. Both Margaret Thatcher and, to a lesser extent, the French president, François Mitterrand, had initially been sceptical, with Thatcher privately telling Gorbachev that, quotes, we do not want the unification of Germany. So um, Soviet leaders were, to some extent, at the mercy of events on the streets of Central Europe, but so too were their Western counterparts. Back in the USSR, to come to some notable recent 30-year anniversaries, as 1991 dawned, it was by no means obvious that the Soviet Union was collapsing. On the 13th of January 1991, 14 people were killed when Soviet troops smashed their way into a TV station in the Lithuanian capital Vilnius. So the idea of still keeping the Baltic republics in the Soviet Union um, is still uh, on the agenda for um, elements in the uh, so Soviet security state uh, at the be beginning of 1991. It was only on the 3rd of March 1991 that independence referendums were held in the other two uh, Baltic states, Latvia and Estonia, uh, about which, in the case of Estonia, third-year students Maya Gruhl and Grace Marks will be speaking at the conference. Indeed, on the 17th of March 1991, a referendum across the USSR actually voted in favour of keeping the 15 Soviet republics, the 15 component um, mar uh, component um, sets of uh, the wider Soviet Union together. Arguably, it was only the failed coup against Gorbachev by Soviet hardliners on the 19th of August 1991 that really precipitated the various republics to declare independence. And uh, even then it was with varying degrees of enthusiasm. Take the case of, of Ukraine. Ukrainian independence had looked rather unlikely 
um, even on the 1st of August 1991, when American President George Bush went to Kiev and uh, gave what has been dubbed his uh, Chicken Kiev speech, because he stated that the, the US would not support Ukrainian independence. You know, we, we, we might imagine at this distance that um, the, the US is, is um, you know, all, all too keen to, to uh, break up the Soviet Union. But no, they're, they're more interested in instability at this point. Now, clearly, things were moving fast by the time Leningrad reverted to uh, its uh, old, old name of St. Petersburg on the 6th of September. And uh, the die was, was cast by the time the newly independent Russia, Ukraine and Belarus agreed on the 8th of December to replace the Soviet Union with the new Commonwealth of Independent States. But the overall point is that few of these dramatic developments uh, in the course of, of 1991 had necessarily been uh, inevitable or even predictable two long years beforehand when the Berlin Wall fell. Even in the former satellites, the transition was not overnight. In Poland, for example, it was not until December 1990 that General Jaruzelski, who'd crushed Solidarity, um, the famous campaign for, for free trade unions in Poland with martial law in 1981, uh, resigned as president. And it wasn't until the same month that the anti-communist Polish government in, in exile in, in London um, finally wound itself up. Uh, and we can kind of declare the, the transition, um, the formal transition uh, in Poland complete. Not until the 29th of November 1990 did renamed communists leave power in Bulgaria. Because as you can see from this chart of the uh, Bulgarian election results in June 1990, the renamed Bulgarian communists actually won free elections. A feat occasionally replicated thereafter elsewhere, such as in Albania in March 1991 or Hungary in 1994. And it was only in June of 1991 that the newly united Germany voted to move its capital from Bonn to Berlin and that the Warsaw Pact and Comicon, the, the um, military and economic alliances um, cementing um, the, the Soviet Union with, with its sat satellites were formally disbanded. And finally, apart from Eastern Germany, not until 2004 would any of the other ex-communist states be admitted to the European Union. So the transition is not overnight. OK, so how are we to make sense of this uh, rather messy process? Well, I found a great quotation for you from the Bulgarian political scientist Ivan Krastev, who was an advisor to the first post-communist government in, in his country, um, that I think sums up nicely the central problem of interpreting 1989. Namely, that it's not just a historiographical problem, but also a political one. So as uh, Krastev has written, 1989 was the revolution that everyone appropriated. Liberals, leftists and conservatives all fell in love with this year because it reinforced certain assumptions each of them had about the world. For liberals, 1989 was the moment when liberalism discovered its revolutionary potential. Classical Marxists were optimistic because it provided an opportunity to reinvent a non-Stalinist left. For conservatives, it was about the failures of the planned economy. And nationalists, such as Kaczynski, referring to the, the former Polish Prime Minister Jaroslaw Kaczynski, felt on the winning side because they had been strongly an anti-communist. So let's try to unpack what Krastev is getting at here. The most obvious part of his 
trilogy is the first part, the Liberals. Timothy Garton Ash was far from alone in, in his enthusiasm for what 1989 implied about liberalism's revolutionary potential to sweep aside authoritarian governments. The most notorious example of post-1989 liberal triumphalism was the American political scientist Francis Fukuyama, who rashly claimed, what we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War, or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. That is the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. Now, given all the water that's uh, passed under history's bridge since 1989, critiquing Fukuyama's end of history thesis is not hard. These days, even Fukuyama himself doesn't believe in the Fukuyama thesis. But the uh, liberal interpretation of 1989 is, is still alive because it rests on a, a somewhat more limited set of claims than Fukuyama's about what actually happened uh, in uh, 89. For example, Vladimir Tismanianu, a prominent historian of Romanian communism, writing from a, a, a um, broadly liberal perspective, has argued that 1989 represented a new vision of the political. As Tismanianu wrote in a 20th anniversary special issue of the, the journal Contemporary European History, which is um, a very useful journal, by the way, for the kinds of things that we're discussing at this conference, because it covers well both Eastern and Western Europe. Uh, so do uh, take take a look look at that special special issue and other articles in that uh, in that uh, journal if you want to, um, to 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 follow that further. But uh, uh, as uh, Tismayanu wrote, the 1989 uh, revolutions represent the triumph of civic dignity and political morality over ideological monism, bureaucratic cynicism, and police dictatorship. Rooted in an individualistic concept of freedom, programmatically sceptical of all ideological blueprints for social engineering, these revolutions were, at least in their first stage, liberal and non-utopian. Unlike traditional revolutions, they do not originate in a, in a millennialist vision of the of perfect society, and they rejected the role of any self-appointed vanguard in directing the activities of the masses. So, I suppose you could say that for liberals, 1989 was almost their 1917. But a model of revolution defined, as you can tell from uh, Tismanianu's rather loaded references to self-appointed vanguards and ideological blueprints for social engineering, defined precisely by not being the Leninist model of 1917, but rather a return to civil society outside the state. Now, there's an element of, of truth in this interpretation. The one thing that all those dissident intellectuals in crumpled genes like uh, the, uh, the, the famous Czech dissident Václav Havel did not envisage until the, the, the events of autumn 89 was that they would ever actually take power. The irony here being that the Harville um, ends 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 up as the um, pr president of of um, Czech Czechoslovakia. So um, in that sense, they're not Lenin arriving at the Finland station uh, in in 1917. But there's also, I think, an element of wishful thinking about turning 1989 into a kind of template for nonviolent revolution. As many of 1989's subsequent would-be Im imitators for, um, from uh, Ukraine in 2004 to the Arab Spring in 2011 discovered, because um, this interpretation of 1989 can make bringing about radical change sound much easier than it actually is. Now, this parallels a different kind of wishful thinking in the second part of Krestev's trilogy. There were also plenty of people on the radical left in Europe 
who got very excited about 1989, such as the remaining cohorts of wannabe Lenins in the West. As Alex Kalinikos, Marxist theorist and chief ideologue of the Socialist Workers' Party, which, partly as a result of the Communist Party of Great Britain winding itself up in November 1991, became the largest faction on the British far left. As uh, Kalinikos put it, Now classical Marxism can finally shake itself of the Stalinist incubus and seize the opportunities offered by a world experiencing greater uncertainty and agitation than for many decades. It's time to resume unfinished business. So whereas left intellectuals who'd cut their teeth in mainstream communist parties, like um, most famously the historian Eric Hobsbawm, tended to become very pessimistic about the possibility of positive social change after the end in 1991 of what Hobsbawm called a short 20th century, seeing only disintegration and a rapid descent into disorder, barbarism, xenophobia and fundamentalism, by contrast, Trotskyists like Kalinikos, a uh, descendant, by the way, of the 19th century Whig historian Lord Acton, were happy. Because 89 appeared to show that the Trots had been right all along. That what existed in Eastern Europe was nothing to do with socialism. Now, where they had a point was, and this is the, the thing that tends to be forgotten, that many of the opponents of state socialism in Eastern Europe in the 1960s, 70s and 80s were opposing it from the left. At least to begin with, movements like Solidarity in Poland were much more about workers, about um, trade union rights and even um, for some workers self-management than they were about restoring capitalism. And that's why many on the Western left um, including Trotskyists, rallied to their defence. But where the Kalinikos version of history became wishful thinking was that it underestimated the extent to which the Soviet experience had tainted the very idea of the left for many Europeans. This view, I think, conveniently implied that the hard task of reckoning where the roots of what had gone wrong in the Soviet Union might lie within the Marxist or Leninist tradition no longer needed to be done. All that was necessary, somehow, was to restore a pristine classical Marxism somehow untainted by the horrors of Stalinism, and the left could carry on the slate wiped clean as if nothing had happened. Um, so, so there's some wishful thinking going on there uh, on, the, on the radical left um, about 1989 uh, as, 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 as well um, as amongst liberals about, about 1989. Yet at the same time, those on the um, kind of radical right of Western politics also took from 89 what they wanted. So hence the, the final part of Krastev's trilogy and his important point that nationalism was a much more important part of the 1989 epic than liberals had been ready to admit. Here's a quotation from Roger Scruton, the English philosopher who died in 2020, a truly conservative thinker in the sense of being uh, deeply reactionary, who was very influential on the Anglo-American right uh, and beyond. Um, he, he was personally involved in, in solidarity with with Central European dissidents, as much as a, a liberal like Garter Nash or a, a social democrat like, like uh, Tony Judd. Uh, at one point, uh, Struton was actually pushed down the stairs by, um, by the uh, Czech secret police. Now, in Scruton's version, what the masses of Eastern Europe were longing for was a conservative restoration. So, so he's arguing that solidarity was a genuine working class revolution, but what they, what they want is an, is an end to, to, to socialism and a movement in the direction recommended by conservatives. Now, again, you know, there, there is, there is some, some element of, of, of truth somewhere in this. Um, this, you know, this is a point perhaps we can, 
we can debate on the morning of the 22nd of March, in that it would be naive to deny that there were elements of conservative restoration in what followed after 1989, and that there was a social con constituency um, amongst, uh, amongst substantial numbers of people for a conservative restoration. Because it's important not to overstate how representative the generally internationalist pre-89 dissident intellectuals of, of uh, Central Europe were of their wider societies. As a, so as early as January 1989, the, the left-wing Scottish writer Neil Asherson was presciently predicting, um, in an article he wrote um, for Marxism Today, the um, theoretical journal of the, the, the Communist Party of Great Britain, he was presciently predicting um, that for this reason, blood and soil nationalism is going to revive in Eastern Europe. And uh, afterwards, a kind of neo-traditionalism indeed became the order of the day in Eastern Europe, bearing out some of the, the more pessimistic pronouncements of uh, Asherson or um, Eric Hosborn. Because when it came to, for example, gender politics, many men in Eastern Europe reasoned that, well, the communists were favor, in favour of gender equality, Therefore, gender equality must be a bad thing. So no wonder Roger Scruton actually got given a medal by the current far right law and justice party government of Poland. Um, because this this interpretation um, you know, very, very much um, cements um, this this uh, conservative nationalist tradi neo traditionalist reading of uh, the meaning of 1989. Um, even even though, as as, we, as we've seen, it's a very partial partial reading. So, to sum up, Krastev's quotation. I'll leave you leave you with it with it there. Is a good way into understanding that everyone, whether they be liberals, Marxists, um, conservatives, all saw the 1989 that they wanted. And um, that's, that's, I think, um, an appropriate point to, to pause, and we'll talk further in part two of the lecture.